So to begin with, I'd like to ask the superintendent to just start out with some uh, short introductory remarks uh, about her hopes and uh, the challenges we face in public education. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all for coming. I think this is a wonderful focus on education, and I am glad to be a part of the conversation with you. As we step forward, it's only been eight weeks since Inauguration Day, and um, actually, I think we've really been able to accomplish a few things already that will produce um, increased time on instruction. That's really what I'm focusing on as well as um, a way that we can highlight the crisis that we are in with our teacher shortage. So there have been a number of things that we've started to focus on and um, we are recognizing that we need to have leadership that will be collaborative and inclusive. Uh, that's part of why I ran. Um, that's important to me. We're still in a period of transition. But uh, I want to hear from you, and I, I'm glad I had a chance to meet many of you who are seated here tonight with us. Thanks for giving up your time. I'll learn a lot, even from the questions. Um, but being in the schools and being with community stakeholders like tonight uh, provide for me the kind of input and perspective that is important, I think, as we move forward to solve really immediate needs and lingering challenges in Oklahoma education. But I thank you for the opportunity. A superintendent, um, I'd like to ask, Oklahoma has never really been a big funder of education. Okay. Uh, last year, in fact, we took a look at teacher salaries going back for decades. In 1969, 1970, we ranked 46th. Now we rank 49th. I think it's similar for just general per pupil spending. So it's whether it's Democrats or Republicans in power, it doesn't seem like Oklahomans or Oklahoma leadership seems to really value education. And if that's the case, why? I do think we value education. So uh, well, if you look at the amount of our total budget um, for appropriated funds, it is a significant percentage but we must keep it at the forefront. And I think we have to have a conversation about how we set our priorities, what we do with the hard-earned taxpayer dollars that we are entrusted with by the legislature, and then focus on results for students. But uh, I definitely think that we cannot ignore the fact that we have the only two states that pay their teachers less than Oklahoma. That's Mississippi and South Dakota. Um, that's, you know, really a question then that puts to rest the idea of, well, what about, you know, cost of living adjustments and where we are right now? There's just two states lower. And if you are um, in Oklahoma um, teaching with, uh, you know, PhD, 25 years experience, you can actually make more money at a fast food restaurant like Chipotle in only three years. So we're at a place that we cannot ignore the crisis, but our teacher shortage is just not about money, but it is the significant amount of the funds that we have dedicated for education, which go directly to the classroom, and that means teachers. We're facing a budget shortfall of about $600 million, and I think everyone has the question, where are we going to get the money for the funding that you're asking for for the next fiscal year? And, and we do. We have a historic shortfall of $611 million. So I recognize that. I'm, I'm on the Board of Equalization. I had to certify that number as well. Um, about last week, actually, I think it was. Uh, maybe the week before. Everything's kind of running together right now. But it, it, we are um, going to need to modify what we have requested. And so if I could just kind of jump in with something that we're proposing, and I still stand by this proposal regardless of a budget shortfall, because the need isn't going to change. Uh, we have students. We owe it to our youngest generation to have vibrant professionals in the classroom. We know that it is the classroom teacher who is the most important person in the schoolhouse in affecting student achievement. So that is why this is so important. And when we are going to propose an eight-year plan, which I'm, I'm wanting to do, 
uh, the first part of that is going to be ensuring that we have an effective and high, highly motivated teacher that will stay in Oklahoma. But if we're going to do that, then I'm proposing a plan to lift us out of the bottom of many of these lists that we find ourselves in. And if we're going to lift out of the bottom quartile, we're going to have to change the behaviors and the practices and the policies that got us there. So part of that is making hard choices even in difficult times. I'm proposing that we increase our days of instruction to reach the national average, which would be five additional days of instruction, plus $4,000 across the, the board pay increase and $1,300 to cover those five new days in five years. So we're kind of phasing that in. We're calling that five days, $5,000 in five years, or you could say more precisely, hashtag, okay, high five. But what, what that's going to do is reach more of a regional average in our teacher compensation. And that is what it's gonna take to really um, re attract and retain top talent because we're losing teachers to other states, other industries, and it's not just Texas that we're competing with, it's, now it's Chipotle. Oklahoma, I, I, th I think, is seen as an underperformer in education. We, we are below the national average in the nation's report card tests. Uh, we have a large achievement gap, like many other states. Um, so critics would say we have been investing in education, more money over years, many years, and uh, it's not working. Why should we spend more money on education now? Isn't it just throwing good money after bad? That's a logical question, and it's one that I understand where that comes from. Um, but what I will tell you is, as I have spent 92,000 miles in Oklahoma driving across the state um, what I, over the last year and a half, what I've seen is a lot of effort, a lot of work, good work. But what you see is an inability to get traction. So we can't continue to mistake motion for progress, but there are factors that really are preventing our schools, our teachers, um, from gaining the kind of traction that we need. The talent is there, and we, we sadly are losing some of that talent because of things like our um, teacher compensation and the um, attractiveness of other states around us. But at the same time, we are at, I believe, a tipping point that if we don't address this now, and we will need to invest because we have 40,000 more students, but we're operating on the same dollars. That cannot really um, help us in any way gain the kind of traction unless we address the needs of those students. Every child deserves to have a free and appropriate education, and I would say a first-class education, and I will fight for that. If I'm not the advocate who will be, I should be. I'm not going away, and I'm gonna to continue to ask our, le our leaders in the legislature for bold leadership, but I also have an obligation to look at our entire common ed budget and find something to contribute to solve this, where we would set something aside to make way for a portion of that teacher pay increase. But it is that important that it is going to need to also be a priority for all. And, you know, frankly, no one's coming to the rescue. Um, our kids are counting on us to get it right. And it's going to take continued focus and the will of the people to send that message to those who represent them that this is a priority for them. It is for me, and I'm asking for that help from you. You want, you want to add five instructional days? Yes. Do you think that will move the needle on academic performance? I do. I absolutely do. Do the studies show that? Yes, and well, here's, here's the thing. When you look at what is happening in the states that are spending time on instruction, rich instruction, then they are going, we are going to see the kind of improvement that they are, are also um, experiencing. We have one of the sh states who has the shortest calendar year. Then on top of that, we layer on additional testing and mandates. 
So when we can find relief from those kinds of mandates that are um, really just red tape, you know, frankly, every mandate we pass at the legislative level will ultimately make its way and land on the desk of a teacher. So this is a complex thing when we talk about um, losing teachers, because as I said before, it's not just about pay. Every position or profession or um, occupation has two things. They have job compensation, and they also have job satisfaction. In Oklahoma, both are low in teaching. So when that happens, we're in trouble. And if we don't start addressing that in multiple ways, we're not going to see the kind of traction. And part of that ability um, for our teachers to stay in the profession is let them teach. We're not doing that as much as we could, and that's why it's important to add more instruction time. Teachers want to do what they were trained to do. We need to set high expectations, but then I believe government needs to get out of the way and let teachers teach. I'd like to ask you a question. In some states, uh, referendums have passed that would sort of you know, a sales, that would add a sales tax to fund education. Do you think Oklahoma should ever consider a, um, an initiative petition to in, impose a sales tax that would help fund education or increase funding for education while maintaining, while not letting it just supplement what's already there? Well, I think before we even have to answer that, we have to look at how we're spending the money we have, or I would suggest we look at the ineffective tax incentives that we do have. Those tax incentives that are effective, we need. I'm a businesswoman. I understand the need for that, and, and so, so do our um, business communities. But those that are ineffective, we need to review and eliminate. And if we do, we will have enough money to do what is needed in education. That's, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that we leave on the table in ineffective tax incentives. So I'm not asking to do anything with those things that work, but I am asking that we review. And that is what I'm talking about when I ask for bold leadership. I'd like to ask about, um, there's been a rollback of education reforms. Um, a dilution of the third grade requirement, Common Core, of course. Um, many of the things that were sort of set in place uh, in Florida. Do you think we're rolling back too many of those reforms, or how far should we step that back? Okay, I'm going to argue with you here, because <laughs> I don't think we've rolled back. Um, here's what I would say. So, reform doesn't happen just because we pass a law or adopt a policy. Reform happens when people come together to do the hard work of implementing that reform. That takes working together, inclusive and collaborative leadership. That's where we have failed in Oklahoma. That is why I ran. We need a new leadership because of failed leadership. That's it. It's going to take working together, setting aside differences, recognizing we're not going to always agree on every fine point. But what we do agree on is that the children of Oklahoma deserve to have a competitive education, one that prepares them for their next steps in learning. So when we talk about different reforms, so, you know, I'm happy to visit with, take those individually. But for instance, the RSA, that's the Reading Sufficiency Act. Um, and, and there are some that have portrayed that in the press that that has been watered down. Um, I would argue that if you count the success of that current legislation that includes a committee of people who know a student best, um, I, believe, you know, I, I believe in the idea that those closest to the problem have the best hope of solving it. And in education, I believe that means those closest to the student have the best hope of serving that student as an individual in the most appropriate and effective way if they know them, if they've known them all year, if they also know what is required of the next year. So that's why a committee of people who are um, involved in that education of that child, teacher uh, in third grade, the fourth grade teacher, a uh, reading specialist, the principal, the parent, we must always keep parents engaged and not shut them out. 
but those who would judge the success of that bill by the number of students retained, then it is successful because this past year, with those parent committee and uh, in place, there were more students retained than ever before in Oklahoma history. I'd like to jump to letter grades. Um, it, there's no controversy around the subject at all, but Not at all. Um, you've described them as a kind of fun house mirror yes. right now. So I would want to ask what kind of grading system or assessment would you, would you want that parents could understand? I mean, after all, we give children letter grades, right? Absolutely, and children are given a report card that measures many different topics. And that's basically what I would be calling for. Um, it is the idea right now that we are um, using a letter grade as a single indicator to measure a school. Well, if we were to give Oklahoma a grade right now, well, we would be asking, well, what are we grading? Is it economic development? Is it entrepreneurial opportunity, health and wellness, uh, cost of living, um, education opportunities, infrastructure? There's many different categories. Each deserve its own grade. It's when you try to weight it in such a way that you have a composite score at the end that makes the statistics of that highly volatile. So what we have right now is, is unreliable, it's invalid, and it's not useful. So instead of being a mirror that reflects back accurate information, which our communities deserve, our schools should be able to you know, provide, and they should also be able to gain um, information that is instructive for them as well. Instead, what we have is like that carnival funhouse mirror that's wavy. There's a distortion to it. So it is not useful, meaningful, or reliable. My request is that we mend it, don't end it. But we do need to have accountability and transparency. Um, and I don't mind if it's called A through F. It's just that it needs to work. And it needs to measure what schools do. And it's complex. And we can't, we can't have a bumper sticker solution on something so very complex and important. Is there any... Is there any process underway now to, yes, to change actually, that there system? Um, we, we have um, entered into a partnership with our state's two research universities, OU and OSU, to work with experts all across the country through those two universities um, to really lead and have um, a, national a national model on school accountability that um, I believe we would like to have prepared for next year's legislation. Um, but this is not, in my mind, the year. Um, if we were to think about that eight-year plan of how are we going to achieve higher outcome and education, academic attainment for students, the first thing is to deal with teachers and have a vibrant professional in the classroom and solve that. Um, funding is an issue, standards are an issue. A through F is something that I don't believe is um, something we need to really be focusing on right now. My commitment is to act on evidence, not anecdote, not perception, as I've said before. And this is the first way we get there, is to have the um, confidence that what we are producing in that metric is going to be something that is truthful and like a mirror that reflects back key information that we need. We can't make good decisions if we don't have good information. I'd like to open up to uh, questions to the audience. Uh, again, we have two people with microphones. We have a question up front here. I have to disclose that I am a school counselor and I've been in the homes of probably 2,000 black, white, Hispanic homes. Mm -hmm. Alone, I decided that I would encourage wherever I could for people to have books in their homes because I was shocked to see how few books are in the private homes of our families that send their kids to school. Mm -hmm. If there's one thing that we know that is related to high school graduation rate, it is the kindergarten word fund level of these kids. Will you this is the question part. Will you be able to step outside of the boundaries of your role?
because nobody's ever done this before, to work with Public TV, Cox Television, the Oklahoman, the various school superintendents around the school to do what we can do to increase the word fund that's being taught to our kids before they go to kindergarten. That's the number one criteria. Will you be able to do that? So early, that preparedness is, is key. And that, that's actually how I've been, as, uh, I'm, I'm an early childhood, um, I, I taught first grade, reading is very important to me. Um, and then also over the last 15 years, I've been working with international curricular standards, um, where we, I, I, I've had 4,000 students, myself personally, and um, at any one time, there's about 250 of my students are in three years old through kindergarten. Now, it's, it is the, the fundamental of just even vocabulary we know through research is a predictor of success academically. And it is important that we have, um, I think, a paradigm shift of what we even refer to as parent engagement. Sometimes I, I think there are those who think parent engagement means we drop off for guitar lessons, we drop off for you know tutoring session over here, um, but it, it is so much more than that. And, and I think that you're correct, where we don't have that need being met in the community, in the home, um, you know, our churches, our, our religious institutions, our communities um, at the schools have to step in and provide what's needed. Our kids can't wait when their parent is incarcerated, um, absent uh, due to mental illness or struggles um, physically. And it is something that is a great concern for me. Um, I, I am very interested in working with those philanthropic organizations that recognize that this is, that early intervention is key. And uh, where we don't have the funds, we, we want to partner with people who have the passion and are willing to work and rally and volunteer and help. Um, but that is key. I'm, wi I'm with you on that. Question in the back. Speaking of accountability, I'd like to ask, uh, what can we look forward to from the State Department of Education in terms of accountability for grants that your, the, the department lets out across the state? Will you be looking to see if, in fact, you're getting the results that you expect from those grants once they're put out there? Very good. Um, I do know that, that there have recently been a competitive grant process that has asked for uh, research proven um, grants to be given to, to programs that are research based. Um, so I know that there is an, definitely an awareness that this is um, something that is a responsibility of the State Board of Education through the State Department of Ed. Um, and also as, in terms of the use and, and partnership in a way or working um, um, in a cooperative way with those philanthropic um, organizations. I'm, I certainly think that that is um, definitely something that I'm interested in and want to continue. That's kind of the spirit of volunteerism is strong in Oklahoma and we have a number of stakeholder groups that want to be a part of of the work as well as the support. So I, I certainly hope that if you find that that is not happening, would you please let me know um, so that we can address those needs that um, I may not be aware of. Okay, does that answer your question? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, another question in back. Where's my child? Hi, um, I'm Nadine Gower. I'm a teacher at Crooked Oak. I teach sixth grade English. <coughs> To piggyback off of what he said, um, retention, I think, is something that really needs to be looked at. I have half of my sixth graders read at below the fourth grade level. And I can teach anybody about a main idea and the plot and the author's purpose and figurative language. But if I sit you down and ask you a question about a passage that you can't read because you don't have the vocabulary or the skills mm -hmm. to read at that mm -hmm. level, we could go outside and play duck, duck, goose all day for all the good it's going to do at the end result, which determines if I'm a good teacher. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you today who's going to pass that test. And not that they haven't been in school and they haven't been learning anything, but they aren't learning 
when I get them at the level that they should be. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that accountability has to end. It, I, the only person accountable at this point is me. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be accountability with parents. Mm -hmm. the, the ultimate thing in New Jersey where I'm from is, if you aren't reading at grade level, you aren't going to the next grade. You don't get into fourth grade if you're not reading at the fourth grade level at the end of third grade. And I don't know how I have 50 kids in the sixth grade that are, I have some kids that are reading at the second grade level. Well, that's a good question. I mean, yeah. how do you hold parents more accountable? Well, teachers take a lot of the blame for, uh, say, a lack of progress, but uh, if it's not happening at home, mm -hmm. what can they do? Well, we really want to focus on the student, and we really are um, certainly not able to control what happens outside the home, you know, in the home, but what we can control is what happens in the classroom. Um, and definitely, I think you've hit on some really important points about reading, particularly. Um, we, again, if we were to look at what the research says, it's, it says more uh, success comes from targeted instruction, not necessarily from retention. Um, if we have students that arrive into the state or arrive into a classroom, um, with high mobility where those students are gone, you know, again, um, off to another classroom somewhere. Sometimes that contributes to not really being able to um, uh, address with sustained strategy for students and, and these compound problems for kids. Homelessness, um, I had a statistic given to me actually yesterday um, with a group that we were meeting with at the State Department, and I was pretty stunned to hear, you know, we, we were meeting with all of the different offices within the State Department of Education. And just to give you this, um, maybe it won't affect you the way it did me, but it was stunning, that we have 23,000 homeless students in Oklahoma that we know of, that we document and have to report so this is um, stunning when you think about this teacher in sixth grade now who is on the receiving end of children who have, who have had gaps and their needs have not been addressed for a whole host of reasons. And part of the frustration for some teachers is that now it feels that there is a um, disincentive for our best teachers to be working with our most at-risk population because of how the system of evaluation is set up. I'm committed to having professional development, continuous improvement model, and also with our teachers, we want them to be able to have good information so that they can see the growth that has occurred in their classroom. But it does need to be oriented toward professional development and growth, not punitive consequences. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't always have teeth in things that are, um, need, that are framework for evaluation, certainly. But recognizing in that particular situation that you're describing in your own classroom, if we will, I mean, it takes funds to do what is required for kids that have high need. And targeting their reading at whatever grade they are in has to be addressed, not just stopping the reading instruction at second grade or at first grade. And then what, what drives this is that we shift to language arts in third, where we shift because of tests that are going to really dictate what then the emphasis and focus will be. And the higher the stakes are for those tests, it pushes to the periphery other important instruction that makes for a well-rounded education. Um, so we keep compounding the problem as we layer on mandate after mandate after mandate with testing, particularly. And if we look at how we are spending our time and focus on increased time on instruction and less time testing, we're going to be able to address those kinds of needs and also then um, articulating what is actually happening through the eyes of a teacher so that we can go back to the Capitol and explain what the need is and then insist on what we must have to meet the needs of students. But they don't all start at the starting line in the same place. And it is more expensive to teach 
a student who has complex needs. And that is what is faced in many of our um, urban settings as well as rural schools where poverty is a factor. Question at the table up there. What I have heard this language address is prevention. There's not many of us that don't practice preventive medicine. We get our blood screenings, we go in for our annual physicals. Why do we not talk? And maybe in your plan for eight years, there's a preventive course. If you start in kindergarten with full-time reading coaches, instructional preventive teachers, and this is money, in addition to the classroom teacher, then by the time they get to third grade, they are going to be reading. Because statistics show us if you retain them in the third grade, they are more likely to drop out. And so I have not heard anybody address the funding. And I have seen that work where I had three and a half as reading coach interventionists who took kids from K to three, and then we had four and five for 30 minutes each day for a reading instruction, for, um, you know, a preventive program that got them on track. But I'm not hearing that in this state. You're correct, absolutely correct. And I agree, and that is, there is abundant research to support your, your statements. Um, and that is my job, to continue to be an advocate for what is needed so that every child, 688,000 of them succeed on my watch. And that's on your watch too. This is going to take community will to keep it in the front of the conversation. It is so easy for things to just be ignored in education. Um, and there is a cost associated with a strong and successful education when children don't arrive to the classroom ready to learn. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. We can't control all of that. But what we can control is what we do in the time we have them and call upon those who can provide additional support um, beyond the classroom as well as in it. And it, and it is about keeping it, uh, elevating an awareness of what is occurring and what the need is. And that's what I believe I need to do. And not blaming the teacher who is charged with solving this very complex problem times 25 or 30. I have a question. You mentioned on your watch. In the years that you'll be superintendent, do you have any specific measures that you could point to that you think will improve if the legislature and others follow your guidance? I mean, are we can look at an improved NAEP scores, uh, better graduation rates. How can we measure your success? Well, we've set goals, and we've set those with um, actually with the governor's office. Um, we set a graduation rate that we want to see improve. Our graduation rate is too low. Our remediation rate is too high. Um, we must have solutions that are going to accomplish change. It's about results for kids. Um, we can't continue doing things the same way and expect a different outcome. And part of that has to do with how we prioritize. Um, but it also has to do with how we're spending what we're spending, the money that we have. So if I could just tell you how I'm going to change this, okay? okay. <laughs> um, if we will look at the tests that we are giving right now, and there are seven end of instruction exams that are part of ACE um, legislation that was passed in 2005. Now, the ACE law is good. It is about having um, more mathematics, you know, in, in the high school um, curriculum so that there's higher standards for graduation. But what it did was, it, now we've had nine to ten years of the test that was uh, prescribed. An end of instruction exam, seven of them, are required for graduation. Those tests are not looked at ever by colleges, universities, or career technology centers for admission. There's no value after you graduate. They cost $7 million a year. If we shifted to something like ACT, 
or ACT itself. We are an ACT state. Higher Ed Board of Regents determines what their tool across the state will be for measuring high school, college, and career readiness. And this is something we're already going to require in our state. That would save millions and millions and millions of dollars every year that could be redirected toward early childhood, that could be re redirected toward kindergarten, first grade, second grade reading. It would free up time and there would also be something that has value for our students individually as their scores increase, economic impacts would occur for students with scholarship opportunities. We would eventually continue to see our whole state's scores lift, but I have to tell you, as soon as all students are taking it, our scores are actually gonna drop. So be prepared for that, they will, because there's 25% that aren't taking it at all. So when those 25% start to take that, ACT told us, be prepared, your scores will drop. Actually, ACT is something that our state has 75% of our kids taking right now in public school. Now, the head of ACT, though, has said that the test was not intended to be used for these purposes, not for accountability, for sure. So how can we That's right. That so work? here is what, what ACT has, has said, that ACT was never designed to be a... Um, cut score that you take, you get one score to graduate, all right. So that's not what we're asking for. What we're asking for is that you look at the sub-tests. There are four of them. There's math, English, reading. Those are all content tests. Science is not. It's science reasoning. It's not content. So we would need to add, just like um, ACT has a writing test, they also have a suite of science tests, a biology, a physics, um, chemistry. We would probably want to suggest biology because we have a biology EOI. And we're already geared up to teach biology every, all throughout the state. So you add that, you could give the ACT suite of tests, which also could, you know, the work keys is part of ACT. And you have a sliding GPA then you have your multiple measures, which is what research has shown is the best predictor of um, high school preparedness and readiness for next steps in learning. And you put those together, and we would be able to do that for 2.5 million when you add in that extra science test that's part of the ACT suite. That is, again, millions of dollars, and you multiply that over the years, and we have tremendous precious dollars that we could spend for our children earlier to get them ready. But ACT is on board with what we are doing and they've had a seat at the table in this idea. And it is something that should be reviewed and um, I am in support of a test that has value after you graduate. In fact, ACT would have value for the rest of their life because when you go to apply for a job, they ask for your ACT or SAT score. So this have is, a, 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 I think, a win for all students. Have a question here. I'm a 16-year special education veteran. Um, every day, there are more special needs children that are identified on a day-to-day -day basis by school psychologists. And there are these students and individuals, they are in general classrooms and they either have learning disabilities, they're uh, emotionally disturbed, or they have mental illness. And now we, the special ed teacher attrition is getting higher and higher. We have fewer teachers that are certified to take care of these, of these children because the special ed teacher attrition rate is just growing to the roof. How could you address this problem? How would I address the problem with the... Um, the shortage of special education teachers. I mean, this is, again, only, only um, compounded with a teacher shortage. Um, part of this is going to, uh, you know, expands even into general ed, because we have um, a situation right now where we no longer give modified assessments in Oklahoma. And this takes a, a new strategy and a new approach. Uh, we, we had a meeting about this today, actually, at the department, how we really need to be focusing on um, the gen ed teacher, general ed teacher in 
preparing the student that is a special education student um, as they are moving forward and as it relates to assessments. Um, and this will take a shift in the way we train, um, but it has to go beyond just those who are special education certified. I am very concerned that we are um, having provisions in place to fill a position that is not filling it with a um, quality applicant that has the pedagogy that is, uh, and the legal appreciation for the most at-risk population when it comes to learning. Um, and the needs that are, and, and frankly, federal requirements, um, legal requirements at the, at the state level as well. Um, that is a concern that I had coming into this office, and that is something that we are going to address here in the department, but some of that's gonna have to be done also through legislation. So it is on my radar, and it is certainly something that um, is close to my heart. I've spent um, 19 years as an advocate in special education IEP meetings. So this is something that is um, a, a great need in Oklahoma. And you, so I appreciate your comment and your question. A question, a question up on the mezzanine level. Uh, I'd like to revisit the A through F uh, schools judging system. Uh, in all due respect, uh, Madam Superintendent, I think this is a huge waste of money in the state, and it's so disgrading to, to schools who get low remarks. And to the community, everybody in the community knows who, what schools are good and what schools struggle. We don't need a PhD to, to tell us this. Uh, we need support for these schools. Uh, it's, it's so demoralizing for these schools to get this in the newspaper. And your veteran faculty has been struggling for, for decades to teach these children, the parents, are so dis, uh, embarrassed to see their schools. They can't change, no matter what the choice people say. They're there. So don't yep. you have a better alternative than this to help these poor schools? Well, and that is actually, I think, the plan. You know, the plan is to be able to meet the federal requirement um, which is part of our waiver right now, and we'll see what happens with the, reauthoriz the um, ESEA reauthorization in Congress. Um, but we are certainly required to have an accountability system. Um, and, and I do support transparency and accountability, but what I don't support is having something that labels children a failure. Children wear that label that their school gets. And if there is, um, I think the greatest breakdown in that particular system is when you try to reduce something again, as I mentioned, to a single indicator, that single letter grade. Um, it should be about those topics. We should know what is working well and what isn't working well so that we can support it, not so that we can avoid it. Because at the end of the day, I am the state superintendent of public instruction. And it is my job and my hope and my goal to focus my attention on the school, the public school around the corner, so that it's a top choice. So that no one feels the need to flee or leave because of misinformation or because they don't feel safe. But I believe we have great things happening in our schools. And if you look at the study that was done by the researchers at OU and OSU, um, you would find that actually those students that are in an A and B school that are in the subgroups are actually, their, their progress is masked by the current system. And the A through F system that is required by the federal government through accountability for the subgroups is um, actually designed to highlight that particular growth of, of different populations. 
And if that is being masked by what we are using right now in Oklahoma, then there's something wrong. And it is, again, something that even Ed Trust has um, recently seen research that supports and validates the research of OU and OSU. So this is a national problem of those states that use A through F. So I would say this is an opportunity for us to actually lead and have a system that informs but is not misleading. Is there a state that you could point to that whose grading system or assessment system you like for schools? No. No, this is our, this that is seemed, our, that seem to suggest because there's just only, I think, 11 states that are doing this, uh, 10 maybe. Um, and so we, we are at a point where we can actually lead and develop a national model for other states to point to. I'd like to jump just quickly to one other, sure. uh, a bill before the legislature, and that is education savings accounts. You've expressed support for the, um, a Henry Scholarship, uh, as I recall, is that correct? Well, the Lindsay Nicole Henry is for those children who have special education right. needs that their parents do not find the service that they right. need in their school. But that has been supported by school choice of forces. So this is another uh, measure that they also support, which is the savings accounts, which have been put in place in some other states. Mm -hmm. What do you think of those? Are you in favor or opposed to that bill? You know, I, first of all, number one, always want to stand with parents to be able to make the decision for their own kids. Because I think that it is parents who know what their children need, and it may be different within their own family. There may be some who are in public, private, homeschool. Frankly, um, I think that, again, my focus, as I just said, is on the school, the public school around the corner, supporting it, building capacity, school capacity at the State Department of Education so that it can be a top choice. But I am for what works, what is research and evidence-based, what works for Oklahoma kids. I'm not going to say that there's only one way. Um, we can talk about homeschooling. I mean, homeschooling, in my mind, is the most pure expression of local control. But that doesn't mean that homeschooling is right for every family. And so I don't think that there is one right way. I will be very concerned if we erode public education. Question here. Hi, I'm Wes Fryer. I'm a grade four and five STEM teacher. I know you've been to some ed camps in the yes. last year with Oklahoma teachers. I wonder if you could just share some of the things you've learned from Oklahoma teachers and talk a little bit about professional development. Great. Well, I was introduced to ed camp which is, uh, if you're on Twitter, it's hashtag EdCamp, and then OKC is the next one coming up. And it was, in fact, we had to cancel uh, due to the weather last week, and it's rescheduled for this Saturday at Southmore High School. Uh, 450 teachers, school leaders, superintendents, some parents, um, some people from the State Department of Education, I'm going, uh, all coming together on a Saturday. They're not being paid. Uh, there's no cost. And it's from 8.30, I think, until 3, 3.30, something like this. And it is professional development. And it's a coming together as a community and taking on the task of continuous improvement as professionals and collaborating. And this is something that Oklahoma has been leading in. And I was introduced to it while, actually, I was on the campaign trail uh, back a year ago, February. And I've gone, I think, to six of them all over the state. And it's, it is uh, really a new ed tech direction for our state, for our teachers, for our professionals that is catching on across the state. And I think that this is an example of how we have energized, vibrant professionals in our teaching ranks and in our school leadership you know, pool can, and, and uh, throughout the state in, in schools. And this is uh, exciting to be a part of. I have learned a lot. I have learned a lot by listening, by attending. In fact, I attended one where I was filling out the little sheet of paper and I just forgot what I was doing. I just thought it was a kind of, what do you hope to get out of today? And I said, listening to teachers. 
And um, then next thing I knew, I was giving a session called Listening for Teachers. And it, it, I didn't realize that that was the form you turn in to do your own session. And that's kind of how it works. It's called an unconference. Um, but this is something that is really organic and it's an exciting um, and open forum for all of Oklahoma to participate in. But uh, I think that when I attend there, I have great hope. I come away with great hope for what we can accomplish in Oklahoma because I have seen the best and they are working for their kids on their day off on Saturday and traveling from all over the state to join together and it's a good thing. Question in the back? Mm -hmm. oh, there's a question right here too. Oh, okay. First of all, Joy, I want to say thank you very much for asking us to collaborate with you. Thank I you. think that's a great thank step you. forward. Uh, I'm here as a retired educator, recently retired educator, and um, have a great amount of knowledge about what goes on in the schools. I happen to have retired from the urban setting, but the problem that exists is statewide, it's nationwide. A lot of the things in society today have changed our parental preparation with children. So I volunteer with Smart Start Central Oklahoma, and we are about helping parents learn how to get their children prepared for school. Yes. And so my feeling is that if we cannot do something to help bring our parents in with the children birth to five mm -hmm. before they start to school to help them learn how to prepare their child, we're always going to be behind. Mm -hmm. We all know brain research tells us that what they learn those first five years are the most important. So teachers are always behind the, they're always behind. Yeah. They're trying to catch up with their child, with their children. And so we need to be in a p position where we can help children, help parents help children. Because we can't change the societal issues until we reach deep down and help those parents prepare their kids to, to be ready for school. And so while we have a lot of money going into the testing, into professional development for teachers. Teachers can gain a wealth of knowledge, but it can't help them with the child that comes in three years behind where they should be. Sir, so is, your, is your question about what, what we can do or what, what can the superintendent? What can we do? How can we support positions like Smart Start Central Oklahoma, which, is mm -hmm. con which we have money from the state and community partnerships, and we go into schools and Smart Start in the schools right now has children come in with their families before school age, and we work with those families, but it's a very min minuscule amount of people so that get that, and so we need to do more of it. And Early Birds does it on uh -huh. Saturdays when we help parents, but until we get to the parents and give them a voice yeah. and help them understand the needs, yeah. we can't go forward in the schools. Thank you. Very good. And you know, we also do another thing that hasn't been mentioned today, but really just dovetails with the comments that you made. We have a uh, large English language um, learner population as well. And we have parents that want to be able to help, um, that are ready to support, and um, yet they are not, um, equipped to be able to, to uh, help with some of the English reading. So um, the, again, layers of, of uh, complexities here. Uh, there, there are great examples of how we have had success. I know here in Oklahoma City, WizKids is uh, very, very uh, successful, um, coming together through congregations in the um, religious sector who are volunteering. I know in Tulsa, there is a wonderful, uh, I, I was witness to this at Eugene Fields Elementary, um, Reading Partners is another program that's similar. Um, and it's, it requires a volunteer once a week for one hour. And it is very scripted, but they are in a room where they're all together with their child. And they have actually um, seen incredible growth on the reading scores that the state is giving on these state tests. Um, but more importantly, on reading tests, because the state's third grade reading um, examination in the past, at least, has not been a pure reading test. So we need to be very careful how we describe that. But there is, we have documented success. Now we need to scale that up 
and, um, and really deliver that across the state where there's need. But we have, you know, Oklahoma is known for responding in crisis. We are at our best when we are faced with huge obstacles that would shake the core of, of another state. We roll up our sleeves, we come together, and we do what must be done. And we need to have that approach right now in education. And that's what I believe right now we sit poised, ready for that kind of uh, continued momentum and progress. Again, back to traction. Let's get the traction and get the motion moving in a direction where we actually move the needle and see the changes in our graduation rates and our remediation rates that, are, that d demonstrate the success. We can move out of the bottom quartile. Part of it starts with high standards, but again, you can have the highest standards in the world, but if you don't have the teachers to teach them, what good are they? I'm sorry, a, a woman here has been raising her hand repeatedly and I'd like yeah. to get her, her question in. I'm, I'm persistent. Um, I've been in education for over 40 years and I uh, visit a lot with teachers and principals and uh, superintendents and so forth. I um, often ask these individuals what they find to, uh, to be the challenge of teachers coming into uh, the teaching career mm -hmm. out of the universities and into the schools. And, um, and my background is special education. There are two things that are offered uh, as being consistent and persistent answers, and those being that teachers come from the university programs ill-prepared to know how to literally know how to teach reading using proper scientific methodology, mm -hmm. and they also come from the universities not having any knowledge about classroom management and behavior management of children. Mm -hmm. And when we have these children coming from households where their vocabulary, as we've been speaking all evening, that uh, these children are, have, do not have manners, they don't have language, they don't have civil behavior, and mm -hmm. teachers are expected to take these little children and magically wave a wand over them and be able to get them to be happy in school and uh, behave properly. And this isn't just with the four-year-olds and five-year-olds. This goes up through all grades, and especially when you have a 35% mobility rate of children from one school to another. So what do you suggest we do about the, the, the uh, message that I continually receive that the, chil the teachers are not prepared to know how to teach reading, and, the chil and they also are not prepared to know how to manage the children in the classroom? Well, thank you for that, for that question and highlighting that need. Um, one thing that I'm excited about, um, when you are state superintendent, there's some constitutional um, commitments and certain boards that you're on. One of them is to be a regent on the Russo board, which is our regional universities, which were, began as teaching colleges. So there are six in the state, and every six weeks we meet, at the regents meet. Um, I am really excited to attend those. Um, my uh, most recent, the, most, the past administration didn't as often. And I want to participate in one, addressing what you talked about with classroom uh, management, um, explicit phonics instruction and the ability to deliver that um, to students. But I, I think we have to have a, um, a larger discussion about our teacher college and preparation um, system. Um, you know, if we, if we were to think about how medical careers are um, prepared with a time of mentoring, uh, residency, where there's actually like teaching university hospitals, uh, where, I mean, imagine if there were ways we could have some discussions about how can we do this where we have the best districts that are training those teachers who are coming out um, so that they see best practices out, lived out in front of them, that they are uh, matched up with a mentor teacher 
pre-service, but then also once they're in the classroom. And there used to be programs in Oklahoma that did that, but they were cut because of funding. So what we really have done is graduated students with the information they need to know, and then, and you hope they know, and then just turn them loose and they get snatched up immediately in other states. We're investing in Oklahoma students in higher ed, but then we export that investment to the surrounding states who are attracting the best and the brightest. And they don't have roots yet in Oklahoma, so there's not an incentive to stay oftentimes. Um, and, and there is, this is what we're competing against. So it's, it again is complex, but I think we have to approach it from multiple angles and address our teacher pipeline with the preparedness, but also then the supports that we provide with professional development once we have them as a professional in Oklahoma. And uh, that's a whole nother issue. When we look at the states around us, I understand Arkansas has a phenomenal professional um, development program for their teachers. We are um, really short on that in Oklahoma as well. So classroom management is key. Um, part of this is a cultural issue that has, um, frankly, you know, the, the, the breakdown of the home is uh, something that the consequences of that we are living with in, in the um, classroom today. Question here. Hello, my name is Michael Luchuk. I'm a former teacher at, the, at an independent school here in the city. Okay. Uh, having taught there, I saw firsthand some of the advantages those kids have. Uh, both in my students and in my two children who attended that school. Next year, I'm turning those children over to you for ninth grade in the public school system. Okay. Uh, we're very excited about that. But my question is, you know, in that independent school, the, what I felt the crown jewel of that school was, was its AP program. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on the teaching of AP courses in the public school system? I absolutely support it. We need to be expanding opportunities for students to be ready for college. And by bringing an elective course like AP, um, that school boards, elected school board members choose, um, that is their decision. Um, it's also an elective for parents to decide if they want their children to be a part of it. But my goodness, to have the opportunity to take college work while you're in high school and then receive through a score of three, four, or five on that assessment uh, the savings of thousands of dollars in uh, the you know, ability to not have to take those core classes that are required for your first couple of years, I think that's a great thing. We have a serious remediation rate issue that we've got to address. Our remediation rate is high. Part of what will change that is if we introduce more rigorous coursework that is um, at a college level and AP delivers that. Um, so much of the, um, I think, issue here that we have to kind of remind everyone about when we talk about this is that it is elective and um, any opportunity we have to expand those elective options, I, I'm supporting that, but I, I trust local elected school boards and parents to make that decision for their own family. We'll take one final question. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, so I work in Oklahoma City Public Schools, so that's a little bit of my context, but I, one thing I haven't really heard, I've heard a lot, um, and I work with uh, teachers, professional development, and working with families and communities, and one thing I think is really important that we haven't really talked about is um, systemic inequities that fall along racial and class lines mm -hmm. and how we can actually begin to talk about that and thinking about historical injustice, historical mm -hmm. systemic inequities that have happened. How can we start to set up or how do you plan to set up structures that create more actual just equality for all types of students, all mm -hmm. types of learners? all types of families, and then also how can we train and support teachers to be able to create equality within their classrooms as well? That's great. Well, we, you know, we're right in the midst of doing our teacher equity report for the federal government, which is due in June. And so this is certainly um, at the forefront of our mind at the department. Um, and, it, and it is an issue that we, we cannot ignore. Um, part of it starts with having good information. Um, back to A through F and that system, 
Um, it is masking the performance of students that are in uh, minority population or high risk or uh, poverty or ELL um, in the A or B school. And so that's a problem if we have a system, a framework that is masking their growth and performance. Um, that is something we would never have discovered had it not been for research. And that is why I want to continue to have um, an open door for study and research and provide transparent information so that others can also study. Like, um, you know, our graduation rate, that's hard to find in Oklahoma. I've, I had uh, someone who was moving into the state said, I'm trying to find the state's graduation rate and I can't find it. Well, part of the reason that's difficult is we have a system that's, that's having um, to be uh, modified in how that's calculated and how that information is delivered. So I'm, I'm interested in providing those kinds of transparent information that is public, that the public should have and not have to file an open records request to be able to um, gather. Then we can benefit from the work and research of others as well. Um, but at the same time, we always need to couch the interests um, of the public with the privacy of students. But at the same time, I think what we're talking about is um, aggregate information about population groups. And, um, you know, I would like to have more of a conversation if you have ideas, um, if you have experience or work in that area that you could maybe contribute. I would love to expand that conversation with you. Um, I, I want to partner with those who um, share a passion that all students regardless of where they live, and regardless of what school they attend, should be able to have the very best education, and it should be um, the same opportunity for all, recognizing that they don't all start at the starting line on you know, the first day of school at the same place, and that we must provide the supports for every child to achieve, and that that is our, our you know, responsibility and obligation, and I, I am pleased to represent every child, 688,000 of them. They are all important and they all deserve a first class education. Superintendent, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.